Hello everyone, here we'll be discussing aligned integrals and it's a little bit of an interesting discussion. Let's just get started of course by talking about what aligned integral actually is and the definition can be spoken of as such. So let f be defined on a smooth curve c defined by these parametric equations x is equal to x of t and y is equal to y of t for some value t in between two values a and b. Then the line integral of f along this curve segment c is given by this. So the, the integral notation is integral of, over c, or along c, of f of x comma y ds. Now this s stands for essentially arc, it's difference in arc, um, arc lengths, I guess you can say. And this is the definition of that. Now exactly what this represents is a little hard to describe. Um, so I guess the only real way to do it really is visually. So let me try my best here. So let's imagine this is the xy plane and we have some curve C. Now, technically, since C is dependent on T, so it, the X values for any point on C depends on a value of T. So for instance, if T is equal to zero, you plug in zero into the equations for X and for Y, and then you get certain X and Y values for that particular value of T, if that makes sense. And then when T is equal to one, you get another point, and then T equals two, three, four, and so on. But the point is, as t increases, there's actually a direction here in this so-called parametric curve. So this is basically what c looks like. Now, since c is really only defined between a and b, that's kind of the only region we care about, really, this is a curve segment, if you will. It could be that it's a complete loop. Um, it could be, be that it's from negative infinity to infinity, actually, as well. But usually we'll care about only finite segments, okay? Now, exactly what this integral represents and what this sum represents, it's not too hard to tell when you look at um, actually what this sum means as far as trying to piece it together. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit. But first off, delta si, I haven't explained what that is. X i star and y i star, I haven't either explained those either, but as it turns out, those are just test values. So if you pick any point in a subinterval um, and the ith subinterval of the, um, the kind of sections that we're slicing about, then SI, delta SI, is just the difference in those arc lengths. So here, this arc here, that for instance could be described as S1, this distance here could be S2, this would be S3, S4, S5, and so on. So notice it's not really uh, feasible to make them all the same. So kind of what we saw for uh, integrals up to this point is like delta x, for instance, where there was no subscript on the x because delta x was the, was the same no matter what. But here, delta si, those arc lengths may not all be the same. But that doesn't actually necessarily matter. Um, as, as far as what this integral represents based on this idea is the following. So I'm going to redraw this, but only with the third dimension now. So now we have the z dimension and then x, y, like usual. So let's imagine we have some curve c on the xy plane, okay? Orientated this way, so from left to right. Let's imagine, okay? And let's imagine that we have a curve f that lies on top. So f of x comma y is actually a surface that's on top, imagine, something like that. I know I've intersected over this, but imagine c is below, right? Now, if you project this curve c onto the surface, we actually end up getting this kind of like this, um, well, the book describes it as like a curtain. And basically what we're doing is finding the area of this segment, okay? So I hope that's kind of okay to describe. Basically imagine as uh, you travel on C on F, the actual area of that kind of straight line path, it's this weird like wavy sheet, or I guess curtain is a really nice way of describing it. So that area is actually what this line integral represents. But to be quite honest, we won't really be using this context, but that's just to get this uh, motivated. Now, as it turns out, there's a theorem that basically says that the line integral of f over c, or along c, can actually be written like this, um, essentially due to how we find lengths of an arc, of um, in particular, the arc of c. So it would just be the integral from a to b of this uh, integral, and the way that the arc length formula is proven, the one I just explained right now with integrals, this can be shown similarly. I'm not going to prove it because it takes a little too much time. 
but we will actually be using this quite a bit. In fact, we'll see some examples right now where we'll actually find some line integrals, and then after that, we'll look at a really nice consequence from all of this. So let's take a look at those examples right now. Right, so now for this example here, we want to evaluate this line integral along this curve C, which is the upper half unit circle, or upper half of the unit circle, x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Now, just to get an idea as far as what it looks like, we have this upper half circle like that. Uh, that wasn't actually really good. That maybe looked a little better. Something like that. that looks actually not too bad. So notice here, x is going from negative one to one, and uh, the y value goes from zero to one. Okay. And um, hmm. something that is actually not said in this problem is the orientation. And I don't think the orientation really matters. I mean, we can try to discuss that in a bit. I don't think really it's too big of a concern though. What I want to do first though, notice is that what we saw before is that we needed a variable t. And what t was, was a way of defining this curve. So the curve, we have an equation for that in terms of x and y, but now how can we write them in terms of t? So what t value can track points on this curve? Well, now for a circle, sine and cosine actually track points on the unit circle. So in fact, what we can do is we can let x equal cosine of t, y equal sine of t. That may not be super obvious, but now that we see it, hopefully you can unsee that. And now where is t going to go from? Well, actually, t will go from 0 to pi. If it went from 0 to 2 pi, that would be the whole unit circle. But from 0 to pi only goes from, well, only the upper half circle. And this way of describing it actually allows our orientation to go in a counterclockwise fashion. And I want to say that we're always going to do that unless otherwise um, stated. But actually, uh, the orientation I don't think is too big of a deal, like I mentioned. Because regardless, we're still going to get the same representative um, area if that makes sense. So the orientation I wouldn't really worry about right now. But anyways, now according to what we saw from that previous theorem, this line integral along the curve C of two plus x squared y ds is equal to the integral from zero to pi now of f of x of t, y of t. So x and y are gonna be replaced with what they're equal to in terms of t. So this is gonna be two plus cosine squared times sine of t, just like that. Now remember that this ds gets replaced with this crazy radical, which is what? Well, it's dt now, but inside of the radical, if you don't recall, let me do that off to the side here, it was dx dt quantity squared plus dy dt quantity squared. Okay. Now, as far as what that represents, it's actually, in this case, it's super simple. Derivative of Cosine with respect to t is negative sine, but when you square that, you just get positive sine squared. Derivative of y with respect to t, well, derivative of sine is cosine, so it's going to be cosine squared. And notice we have a Pythagorean identity here. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So, in fact, I'll write that here. This was cosine squared plus sine squared. I think I wrote it in the opposite way, but that's fine. But remember that there's a Pythagorean identity which says that cosine squared plus sine squared of the same argument is 1. Square root of 1 is just 1. So really all we need to do is take the antiderivative of this with respect to t. Because, again, that's 1. Now the antiderivative of 2 is 2t. Evaluated between pi and 0 is 2 pi minus 2 times 0. So that's just 2 pi. Plus the integral from 0 to pi of this term, which is cosine squared of t times sine of t dt. Now this actually from calculus two is a trig integral, and this is actually not too bad because we have a power of cosine and only sine here. And notice if we let u equal cosine, then du is negative sine. Derivative of cosine is negative sine after all. And we have a sine of t dt right here. So in fact, we can replace this with negative du. Because of course, if you multiply both sides by negative, you get negative du is equal to the sine of t times dt. Perfect. And uh, this just becomes u squared. So all we have here now is the integral in u, u squared to u, the negative will pull out to the side or out in front, really. And we can change the limits by evaluating what uh, u is based on when uh, t is zero and pi. Now, when t is equal to pi, u is cosine of pi, which is negative one. When t is equal to zero, 
u is equal to cosine of 0, which is positive 1. And actually, notice we're going from uh, bigger to smaller, not smaller to bigger. So recall that there is a property of the integral that we can swap this by negating the whole thing, which makes sense because if you were to take the antiderivative, plug in the top minus plug in the bottom, but do it the opposite way, it would be the negative of what you would have gotten otherwise. So this is really going to be 2 pi plus the integral from negative 1 to 1 now of u squared to u. And the antiderivative of u squared is u cubed over 3. We're going to get u cubed over 3, evaluated between negative 1 and 1. And in fact, um, there's another property of symmetry we possibly could have used here, but this is fine. Now notice when you plug in 1, you get 1 third. When you plug in negative 1, you get negative 1 third because of the odd power. So 1 third minus negative 1 third is the same as 1 third plus 1 third, which is 2 thirds. So altogether, this is 2 pi plus 2 thirds. Nice. So the setup wasn't too bad. It was just recognizing that we can trace uh, the unit circle by sine and cosine. And then from there, we can implement the formula we had from the previous screen. And then after that, it's just integrate. And in this case, it was a simple uh, u substitution, actually. Awesome. So now on to the next example. Right, so now for this example, it's pretty similar. We want to evaluate this integral along this line um, curve segment. Uh, but by the way, that kind of reminds me. There are called line integrals even though we're not traveling on a line necessarily. It's just a curve. So it may not actually be a straight line, but the language is, for whatever reason, line because that's just how it was when it was first observed. But just know that the curve isn't necessarily a line. It's just some smooth curve. Okay, so here C consists of the arc C1 of the parabola y equals x squared from the point 0, 0 to 1, 1, and then followed by the vertical line segment C2 from the point 1, 1 to 1, 2. So just to draw what that looks like on the xy plane, we have y equals x squared is just this parabola. Now in particular, we only really care about from the point 0, 0 to the point 1, 1. So I'm going to erase everything else that is not in between those two points, okay? Then next, uh, by the way, this is called C1, right? So next, C2 is the vertical line going from the point 1, 1, which is this point, to now the point 1, 2. So it seems like we're going in this kind of clockwise fashion. But again, orientation isn't too big of a concern right now. I'm just kind of bringing it up because that's what it reminds me of, and that's uh, C2, good. And notice this is actually not really a smooth curve because it's a union of two, um, two curves that are each individually smooth. By the way, that is known as a um, piecewise smooth curve. So this curve here, C, is piecewise smooth because it's composed of two individually smooth curves. Awesome. And again, what makes it not smooth is basically we have kind of the sharp edge here, so to speak. And right, so now how do we continue from here? Well, we need to write c1 and c2 each with some parametric equations. So for c1, this is just the parabola. And what we can say here actually is you could say x is equal to t and then y is equal to t squared, where t goes from 0 to 1, which I know sounds super funny because might as well just say y is equal to x squared and x is in between 0 and 1. In fact, if you want to do that, we actually can do that. But the reason why I bring this up is because since our notation previously is based on t, we have to understand the difference. So I actually am going to use x instead of t just to show you, but just keep in mind that everywhere I would write t normally from the previous way we've been doing things, I'll write x in this case, okay? So let's see what that looks like. So now we have the integral over the line c, which is now from the limits 0 to 1, for c1 anyways, and that's going to be... Um, well, that's going to be just the integrand, which is 2x, but actually it's going to be 2x of t, which is really x of x, which is just x itself, actually. And then ds, recall, is the square root of the derivative of x with respect to t plus derivative of y with respect to t. So now, off to the side, maybe I'll write this. So usually we had dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared. And then dt. All right, cool. But now here, remember, instead of t, we're now using x, just so it's kind of less confusing, even though it looks a little more confusing, actually. But it's just something to get used to. It's fine. Notice dx over dx is just 1. 
And that makes sense even if it was t, because if x is t, dx over dt is the derivative of t, which is still 1. So regardless, this is going to be 1. So I'm going to write just 1 squared, which is 1. And then dy over dx, derivative of y with respect to x is 2x. So this is 2x quantity squared, like that. And notice 2x quantity squared is just 4x squared. So if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of erase as I go along, which I generally don't like to do, but just to save some time and space, that's fine. And now dx is now just, well, dt is now dx. So perfect. So now we have this. And this is actually just a simple u substitution. Notice if the inside is equal to u, then the derivative of u that is actually, well, a multiple of this. So we're going to let u equal 1 plus 4x squared. So the du is then 8x dx. And notice to get 2x dx, if you just divide by 4, 1 fourth du is equal to 2x dx. Perfect. So we can replace 2x and dx each with, um, or I guess both with 1 fourth du. The 1 fourth will pull outside of the integral because it's a constant multiple. And the radical I'll write as a 1 half power. It's u inside the radical, so this will be u to the 1 half. Good. And now again, the 2x dx is replaced with 1 fourth du. The 1 fourth is already out, and the du is there. Now, what are the new limits then? Well, when uh, x is 0, u is just 1 plus 0, which is 1. When u is 1, or when x is 1, rather, sorry, u is 4 times 1 squared plus 1, which is 4 plus 1, which is 5. Awesome. Now, what we need to do is take the antiderivative. The antiderivative of u to the 1 half is u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves. That's 1 fourth u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves is just multiplying by 2 thirds. Notice there's actually some cross cancellation here. 2 goes into 4 twice, so this is really 1 over 6 u to the 3 halves. And now evaluate between our new u limits, 5 and 1. So really this is 1 over 6 times the quantity 5 to the 3 halves minus 1 to the 3 halves. Right. Now, 5 to the 3 halves, if you don't know, is just the same as actually 5 radical 5. And then 1 to any power is just 1. So this is really just 1 sixth times 5, times, uh, 5 radical 5 minus 1. Um, I mistakenly boxed this because this is just for C1. This is not the integral over C2. Now, since C is composed of C1 and C2, a nice consequence that I actually haven't mentioned earlier, or haven't mentioned, is that the integral of c, oh, along c of f ds, is actually equal to the integral of c1, along c1 of f ds, plus the integral along c2 of f ds. Which should make sense, because if you think of just taking the area of that curtain or fence we described earlier, really what you need to do is just go along c1 and then along c2, so you're just adding those areas, so you're adding those integrals then. So this here is just the answer for c1, so instead of boxing it, I'll circle it. Since I don't have space, I'm going to have to erase everything here and then move on to find the answer for C2. And then uh, once we have that, we'll combine these finally. Okay, so I've erased some themes and I've written here what we had uh, resulted with so far. That the integral along C is the integral along C1 plus integral along C2 because C is, of course, composed of C1 and C2. The integral over C1 or along C1 we found to be this quantity and the integral along C2 we'll find right now. But to do that, we need to first figure out how we can describe C2 based on a parametric equation or equations. So let's see. Uh, C2 is this vertical line segment that goes from 1 to, well, 1, 1 to 2, 2. Since it's a vertical line segment, then x is actually always going to be 1 in this case because notice the x value doesn't change. So actually x will just be 1. That's fine. And y will actually just be, in this case, y will be changing from 1 to 2. So it's just going to be equal to t, where t goes from 1 to 2. It's that simple. Now, remember what we saw from the previous um, way of doing c1. We wrote x equals x instead of x equals t. So similarly, here we can write this as y, where y goes from 1 to 2. Good. So now, with that in mind, this integral then over c2 is just the integral from 1 to 2 of 2x. And now ds is replaced with the square root of the sum of the squares of the derivatives of x and y with respect to this variable y. Derivative of 1 with respect to y is 0 squared. Derivative of y with respect to y is 1 squared. Well, the squares come from the actual 
formulation of the line integral. And then now it's with respect to the variable y. So I hope this isn't too complicated. I'm going a little fast, but you know, hope you can keep up with that. Now, uh, this is one, so we don't really care about this. And x, what is x? Well, x is actually one itself. So notice it was 2x because that was our original integrand, but with this in mind, x is equal to 1. So now this really is just the integral from 1 to 2 of 2 dy. And the antiderivative of 2 with respect to y is 2y, evaluated between 1 and 2 is just 2 times the quantity, 2 minus 1 really, which is just 2 times 1, which is 2. So with that being said, that's this, and that is our answer. Awesome. If you want to distribute the 1 sixth and make this negative 1 sixth and add it to 2 to write it as a combined fraction, you could do that, but I'm going to leave it like this just because I'm kind of being lazy about it. Well, anyway, so that being said, we'll look at the next idea, and then from there we'll do a few more examples. Okay, so here I wanted to find the line integrals along C with respect to X, and then similarly with respect to Y. Now, recall that what we have been seeing as far as line integrals along a curve C, we've always written ds, which can technically be um, referred to, I guess you can say, in respect to the arc, because s is our notation for our arc length, where here, this is with respect to x and with respect to y. So when you say ds, if you want to distinguish between dx, dy, and ds, you just say with respect to the arc for ds, and then with, with our respect to x and y for x and y. And these are the definitions by Riemann sums, but really what we'll be using actually are these formula here. So notice for um, each of these, all we're really doing is instead of that radical we saw for the ds version, we just have x prime of t and y prime of t. Which actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because that radical that we saw, which just to remind you, that was the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared, now, if we're taking derivative with respect to x only, then derivative of y with respect to t would be zero because y would be a constant in terms of the variable x. Um, in other words, this goes to zero, and this really is x prime of t if x is a function of t. So the x prime of t squared square rooted is just x prime of t squared, and similarly for y prime of t squared. So th these are consequences of the way we would write it with this radical. And by the way, I may not have mentioned this previously, but that radical expression, the, that expression of line integrals with that radical in mind, are really only true when f is continuous, which is usually the case anyway, so I may not have mentioned that little detail. But in any event, in any event let's uh, move on. So here there's a kind of keynote. If p and q are functions of x and y, then the integral along c of p dx and the integral along c of q dy added together can be written like this. Integral along c of p dx plus q dy this is a little bit of abusive notation, but, um, well, not really, but this is kind of customary to write it like this. And we'll actually see an example right now. We'll take a look at something like this. And then beyond that, we'll need to look at one last idea for this video and then one example for that next idea. So let's take a look at an example involving this right now. All right, so for this example, we want to evaluate the line integral along the curve C of y squared dx plus x dy, kind of like the notation we saw previously, where C is described as such. So we have it uh, broken up into two, um, two curves, kind of like we saw in the previous example. C1 is just this straight line going from negative 5, negative 3 to the point 0, 2, where C2 is this parabola, x equals 4 minus y squared, but orientated in this way. So notice we actually have a particular orientation, which I mentioned before, may actually have made a difference. As it turns out, with uh, respect to arcs, it doesn't make a difference, but with respect to x and y, it actually does. So let's see if we can get something cooking as far as these uh, parametric equations go for C1 and C2. Now for C1, there are actually quite a few different ways of doing this. One way you could actually do this is you could just let x equal x and let y equal whatever the line is that goes from here to here. Now if you actually count things, you need to go over 5 to get to this line and up 5 to get to um, from this point to this point. In other words, the slope is 1 over 1. So really, this is 1x plus the y-intercept 2, just from what I know from, well, slope-intercept form from lines. And this actually works. Another way of doing it, though, is to consider what we saw with lines in three dimensions for, with, um, with vector equations. 
And I kind of want to do that, but it'll take a little bit too much time. I mean, it's not too bad because it's in two dimensions. Basically, what you do is you treat these as vectors, subtract them, and then you get the direction vector. So, for instance, if I were to do, uh, let's say, this minus that as a vector, so 0, 2 minus negative 5, negative 3, ends up giving me 0 minus negative 5 is positive 5, and a 2 minus negative 3 is positive 5 as well. So this is the vector, direction vector, v, which is 5, 5. Okay. Now, if we multiply this by t and add one of the points, let's say um, this point, for instance, so we actually get that the line follows the equation r of t equals one of these points, let's say this guy, as a vector negative 5, negative 3, plus the vector v, 5, 5, times t. And you can see when t is equal to 0, for instance, you get this point itself, which here it's written as a vector, but imagine it's a point. And if you were to plug in t equals 1, then you get negative 5 plus 5, which is 0 for the x value, and uh, negative 3 plus 5, which is 2 for the y value. So actually, if t only goes between um, 0 and 1, then this vector equation works. And if you were to actually combine these into one vector in the component form, you get negative 5 plus 5t, that's going to be x, and negative 3 plus 5t, and that indeed is going to be y. So we actually have parametric equations for y and and x, and we have uh, our values of t in this case. Here, this would be different because x would go from negative 5 to 0. So I know I'm kind of showing you different ways, but this way I think is kind of more uh, systematic because it works in three dimensions as well, and it, I think more uh, general, I guess you can say. But I'm going to try this way and let's see if we get something similar. Well, here I haven't even finished it, but you know what I mean. So with that being said, I'm just going to try it this way. But you can try it that way and um, see if you get the same answer. You should. So now let's see. So for C1, we're going to, let's see. So the integral over C1 of y squared dx plus x dy uses these parametric equations. So every, everywhere I see an x, I write x. Notice dx is the derivative of x with respect to, well, x. So in this case, actually, it's just going to be y squared dx. I don't think how that works. Yeah, well, that's fine. So, um, so what is y squared? Well, y squared is x plus 2 quantity squared, like this, dx, plus x times dy. That's what I was looking for. So dy is what? dy is derivative of y with respect to x. So notice derivative of this is going to be 1, and then times dx. So dy is replaced with 1 dx. So notice you have this dx plus that dx. They both have a dx in common. So in reality, this is just the integral of x plus 2 plus x dx like that, if that makes sense. Uh, I forgot a square here. So there we go. That looks a little better. In fact, what I really should do here is actually combine my terms and expand this out in the process. So let me just do that real quick. Now, if you expand uh, x plus 2 quantity squared, you get x squared plus 4x plus 4. And when you add x to it, the middle term becomes 5x. So this is x squared plus 5x plus 4. There we go. It's shaping up really nice. But now our limits for this integral are just the values of x, which is in between negative 5 and 0. Awesome. So now antiderivative of this is just x cubed over 3 plus 5x squared over 2, or 5 over 2x squared, plus 4x. Evaluate between negative 5 and 0. I uh, just want to make sure that things are oriented correctly. Notice I'm going from negative 5 to 0, so it is indeed in this orientation, so just keep that in mind. You plug in negative 5 here, the x value gets negative 5. You plug in negative 5 here, the y value gets negative 3, and then as x travels between negative 5 and 0, you get from this point to that point in that direction, so just to keep that in mind. Now, plugging in the top one 0 gives us 0 because they're all powers of x, minus when you plug in negative 5, Negative 5 to the third is negative 125 over 3, plus 5 over 2 times negative 5 squared. Negative 5 squared is 25, times 5 is 125. Okay? And then when you uh, multiply negative 5 to 4, that's negative 20. If you distribute this negative, we get 
125 over 3 minus 125 over 2 plus 20. Okay, so yeah, how do we combine this? Well, these two combine to, well, I guess it's just 125 times the quantity one third minus one half, which notice is just two minus three, so it's negative one six actually. So this is actually negative 125 over six plus 20. Notice 20 is actually 120 over six, because 20 over one multiply top and bottom by six, you get that. And then combining these now gives us negative five six. Wow. Nice, so we have the integral for C1, now all we need is the integral for C2, but notice the orientation matters. So let me erase things, move this over, and continue for C2. Okay, perfect, so this will be established just now. The integral along C is just the integral along C1 plus integral along C2. Integral along C1, we got negative five, six. Now for C2. Now for C2, we already have an equation given to us, which is x is equal to four minus y squared. So that's an equation for x. So y, we'll just say, is equal to y itself. But now notice y actually goes in between y equals negative 3 and y equals positive 2 up here. And in that order, actually, because we're going in that orientation. So keep in mind, orientation matters here. So y is going to go from negative 3 to 2, just like that. So again, if you were to plug in negative 3 in for y, you get y is equal, well, x is equal to 4, minus negative 3 squared, which is minus 9, 4 minus 9 is indeed negative 5. So we get this point first. When you plug in 2, you get this end point, you'll see. You try that on your own. Um, in fact, it's really easy. 4 minus 2 squared is 4 minus 4, which is 0, so you get 0 comma 2 indeed. Great. Awesome. So now that we have that established, all we need to do now is say that the integral along C2 of y squared dx plus x dy is equal to y is equal to y, so that's going to be integral of y squared. dx is derivative of this. Derivative of this with respect to y is, well, 4 goes to 0, negative 2y squared has derivative, or negative y squared has derivative of negative 2y, dy. Good. Plus x, again, is equal to 4 minus y squared, and then that's dy. Now again, they both have dy in common. Also, the limits are known. They're just those bounds, negative 3 to 2, like this. Let me scoot this over. So integral from negative 3 to 2 of, that's negative 2y cubed, plus 4 minus y squared, and that's all multiplied to dy. Each of those are multiplied to dy. They have dy in common. Perfect. So now what we need to do is take the antiderivative and evaluate. Antiderivative of negative 2y to the third is negative 2 over 4 y to the fourth. Notice negative 2 over 4 actually is negative 1 half after reducing, so that'll simplify things a bit. Antiderivative of 4 with respect to y is 4y. Antiderivative of negative y to the second is negative 1 third y to the third. And now evaluate between the y values negative 3 and 2. When you plug in 2, here 2 to the fourth is 16 over 2 is 8, so it's going to be negative 8. When you plug in 2 here, you get positive 8, so those actually cancel out. That's nice. When you plug in 2 here, 2 to the 3rd is 8, so that's going to be negative... Um, just making sure. Negative 8 thirds, good. Minus, when you plug in negative 3, negative 3 to the 4th is actually going to be 81, positive 81. So it's negative 81 over 2. Okay, when you plug in 3 here, or negative 3 here, you get negative 12. When you plug in 3 here, or negative 3, you get negative 3 to the 3rd is negative 27. Double negative is positive, but then 27 over 3 is 9, so it's just this. And notice these actually combine to negative 3. And then after distributing the negative here, we end up getting negative 8 over 3 plus 81 over 2, and then plus 3. All right. And whew, now what? Well, now we can combine these. Let me do that off to the side here. So 81 over 2 minus 8 over 3 is actually, you can kind of do this crisscross pattern. 3 times 81 is 243. Minus 2 times 8 is 16. 43 minus 16, I think, is 20, looks like 27, so it's 227. Just making sure, okay, all over 6. And that can't be reduced, actually. And then we're adding 3 to that. 3 is... 18 over 6, so we're just going to add 18 to this. Um, so let me write that out. 
So this here is 227 over, no, again, it kind of complicated with this. We get 227 over 6, it kind of cut out. Let me actually emphasize that on top. Sorry about that. So there we go, that's 227 over 6. This is really 18 over 6. And when you combine those, 18 plus 227 is actually 245 over 6. And that's good because notice that's what we need here. 245 over 6 minus 5 over 6 is actually just 240 over 6. And 240 over 6, notice it's just 40 itself. Whew. Nice. So that was the integral over C, the line integral along the curve C of y squared dx plus x dy. Now we need to take a look at one last uh, new idea and then an example based on that. And that'll be it for the video finally. All right, so now the last idea we want to take a look at is essentially this definition, which actually ties vector fields that we saw in the previous video into the mix now. So let F be a continuous vector field defined on a smooth curve C given by the vector function R of T, where T goes between two values A and B. Then we say that the line integral of F along the curve C is this, integral along C of F, dot product with dr. Notice these are vectors here, vector function r of t. And that's actually, believe it or not, equal to the integral from a to b of f of r of t dotted with r prime of t dt, which is also, you can also write it this way, as the integral along c of f dot t ds. So this is kind of the usual uh, um, line integral with respect to a arc length. Here, though, t has to be uh, the unit tangent vector at a point on C. Really what that means is that T of T, you can say, is equal to R of T, or I guess R prime of T, because think of a tangent line, but divided by its magnitude. Of course, divided by its magnitude because, well, um, well, it's the uh, unit tangent vector. Okay. Now, uh, the reason why this is the case is because ds is, again, the arc length, and you can think of that actual arc as being the magnitude of, um, of the derivative of r of t times dt. So when you multiply it by this thing, the magnitudes actually cancel out. So I know that sounds kind of funny because it's kind of like a limiting thing. So we could have described this from a uh, Riemann sum standpoint like we did all of the previous line integrals in this video, but instead I just thought I'd jump the gun a little bit and show you these three parts of this uh, glorious equality here. All right, now with that being said, we're gonna use this to evaluate certain things, and this will actually tie in a little bit to what we saw in the uh, previous idea. So here, for this example, we wanna evaluate this line integral along C of f dot dr, where f is the, uh, the vector field, x, y, i, y, z, j, and z, x, k. So remember that i, j, k notation you can convert to Component notation, if you like that better, or component form, I should say, but that's fine. And C is given by this, so we actually know the uh, parametric equations for x, y, and z of t of uh, C. We don't have to figure that out. That was actually a pretty hard part for the pre previous examples we saw, figuring out the parametric equation. So if we have that given, then it's a lot easier for us. So now here's what I'm going to say. C is given by this vector function R of t, which we kind of haven't quite seen yet. But r of t is just x comma y comma z as a vector. So we can actually say r of t in this case is actually equal to the vector t, t squared, t cubed. Where of course t goes in between 0 and 1. Similarly, we can say f of t is just, well, it's this. It's x, y, y, z, x, y, y, z. Zx. Notice this is really f of x, f of uh, x, y, z, but if it's of t, then this implies that x, y, and z are each of the form, well, they're each in terms of t, really. So in fact, we can say this is just x, which is t, times y, which is t squared, that combines the t cubed. y, z would then be t to the fifth. Zx would then be t to the fourth. Good. So now we can find our prime of t then. R prime of t is just the derivative of each of these, which notice with respect to t is just 1 
2t and 3t squared. Perfect. And now we're set. Now all we need to do is just take the dot product of f of r of t with r prime of t, evaluate between our limits of t, and we're all good to go. So now we can see that this line integral along C of capital F of R of T dotted with, well, I guess it's just F dot, let me write like this, F dot dr, that sounds a little better. There we go. Is just equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of F of R of T, which is this guy. So this is F of R of T. So that's going to be T cubed T to the fifth t to the fourth, dotted with our prime of t, which we just found above, that's 1 comma 2t comma 3t squared, and then finally dt. Perfect. So now if we dot these, we just actually get an expression now. And what do we get? Integral from 0 to 1 of t cubed times 1 plus t to the fifth times 2t, so 2t to the sixth, okay, plus t to the 4th times 3t squared, which is 3t to the 6th, and all of that dt. Awesome. All right, so now all we need to do is take the antiderivative and evaluate. Um, there are a few things I want to say in addition to that. I mean, we could kind of squeeze it in here, but, you know, just so I kind of take a little more time with it. I'm going to erase everything, lift this up, and then continue. Right, so here's where we left off. Notice that I erased things, lifted it up. Actually, something I didn't recognize until I rewrote it here is that these actually combine to 5t to the 6th. So this is really the integral from 0 to 1 of t cubed plus 5t to the 6th dt. Now this is pretty simple and standard to take the antiderivative of. Let's see if we do it. Antiderivative of t to the 3rd is t to the 4th over 4 plus 5 over 7 t to the 7th. That's the antiderivative of 5t to the 6th notice. Evaluate in between 0 and 1. When you plug in 0, the powers of t, so they're just 0. When you plug in 1, though, you just really get just the coefficients. So this is li uh, literally just 1 to the four, 1 over 4 plus 5 over 7, which remember if you do that kind of crisscross trick to add, or I guess shortcut really, to add fractions. This is 7 times 1 plus 5 times 4, which is 27, over 4 times 7, which is 28, which doesn't reduce. So that's actually the answer. Now, there are a few things I'd like to say before finishing the video, and I'm not going to do any other examples or anything. I'm just going to talk a little bit and maybe uh, come to some nice conclusion. So, first off, everything we've seen up to this point in this video was only over two variables. This is over three variables, technically, because we have an x, y, and a z component. Now, we could have spoken about line integrals in, uh, in three-dimensional space, where our function is not of f, not just f of x of y, but f of x, y, and z. Or yeah, not f of x comma y, but f of x comma y comma z. And then with that being said, the curve C would be a three-dimensional curve in the x, y, z uh, space, if that makes sense. That's something I chose not to discuss in detail here, but it's something you can do. Now, when you discuss line integrals like that, then line integral over f, of three variables, ds, is actually just the integral of, well, let's say between a and b for t values, of f of x of t, y of t, z of t, get the idea. But now, the moment you're waiting for this radical part now, how do you handle that with three? It's literally just the squares of each of those with respect to t, derivative with respect to t. So that's dx dt, dy dt, and dz dt there. So just to show you that, because that's something you may possibly come across. But I chose not to go any, over any examples. I just think it's, it's a little too much, but the idea is honestly exactly the same. Okay. Another thing is uh, there's a connection here between what we saw with those, um, those integrals that look something like this, p dx plus uh, qdy. And speaking of which, uh, something this reminds me of is let's say you take the integral over c of f ds and you want to compare what if it was the other way around orientated differently. So let's say this is some curve c, let's say oriented one way, and if you oriented it the other way, which I'll denote in green, I guess, so instead going the other way around, 
let's call that curve negative c. So what happens when you take the integral over c versus negative c? I mentioned this before throughout the video, that actually the orientation is the same with respect to arc length. But with respect to a variable, x or y, they're actually different. And as it turns out, if you were to take the integral with respect to x, for instance, of c versus along c along, uh, versus along the uh, opposite oriented negative c, you end up getting negative that. So if you look back at that example where we did uh, the integral over c1, and I think we got like negative 5, 6, if you did it the other way around, you would get positive 5, 6, which is kind of nice to see that comparison. So that's something I'll allow you to try on your own, but um, again, that's with respect to variables, not with respect to arc length. So just kind of keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay, so now this connection I've kept talking about. So here, these are components x, y, and z, but in reality, x of t, y of t, and z of t in this particular example were not these. They were uh, t, t squared, and t cubed. These guys would be p of x, p of y, and uh, p of, well, I guess I'm writing it kind of funny, but really it's this. This is p of x comma y comma z, a value of a t. This is q, so let's not write the arguments. Let's just write this is p, this is q, and this is, let's say, r. From the notation we saw in vector fields, okay? Here, this is the derivative of the parametric equations. So this is literally dx dt, dy dt, and dz dt. And since we're multiplying this by t, really what you can do, you can think of this as dt being scaled in, and it cancels those dt's. And with that being said, we get this really, really, really nice result that I'm going to show right now. So let me just erase all of this here. And the nice result is the following, and I'll just write it as this, uh, as I guess a fact, okay? And it's the integral along C of f dot dr is just equal to the integral along C of p dx plus q dy plus r dz, and so on, depending how many variables you have. So if you only have two variables, then of course f is only in terms of p and q, in which case you forget about the last one. Okay. So I hope this makes sense, because notice if you take the dot product of this, remember that this dd, dt cancels these, these are dt's, so really we have pqr dotted with dx dy dz, after considering the cancellation, and that dot product is just p dx plus q dy plus r dz, and you get this. And this, we, this kind of form we spoke of previously, so it's nice that we have some relationship between this kind of new idea that we saw at the very end of the video, and this uh, idea we saw right before that. So that's where I'd like to finish. I really hope you enjoyed this. I certainly enjoyed this like I usually do, or well, always do actually. And with that being said, I'll see you in the next videos where we'll be discussing obviously more of this crazy cool fun stuff. So hope to see you in those videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you then.